In this video, I'm going to prove limit statements. This is uh, pretty advanced. This is not something that I'm actually going to require you to do in Calculus 1. I want to show you a couple examples just so that way when you, you, you've seen them, you know how they work. And when you get to higher level classes like analysis or advanced Cal, depending on what your school might call it, you have seen it. Uh, this is something you will be required to do later on in math. So what we actually want to do is prove that a limit is what we say it is. So we're going to do um, prove using a delta epsilon proof that the limit as x goes to 5 of 3x minus 4 is equal to 11. So of course we can find this limit simply by plugging in. We know it's linear, it doesn't have any uh, discontinuities, it's, it's defined at all its points. So we can see that three times five is 15 minus four is 11. That's not a proof, that's just how we find it. So remember the formal definition of a limit states that for epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, uh, such that the absolute value of um, uh, x minus c uh, less than delta implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon. That is what we need to show. So kind of the, the short on that, x minus c less than delta, that should be an absolute value, is less than delta, implies f of x minus l less than epsilon. So in the last video, when we were finding those deltas, we started with this piece, actually. We said if this is what we're trying to show, let's start there, what we want to be true, and let's work our way backwards to see if we can create that number so that it is in fact true. Uh, so let's take the function, the 3x minus 4, minus the limit of 11, and let's set that less than epsilon. Same way we did when we were finding the deltas. The only difference is now we're doing it just for this generic epsilon. Um, so given epsilon greater than 0. Just like before, epsilon is a set number. It's some set number greater than zero, it's just I haven't told you what number I'm using, and I'm leaving that completely general, and that's kind of the point of a proof. The second I go saying that epsilon equal to 0.15 or 0.1 or 1, whatever we're going to set it equal to, we're no longer dealing with a proof. We're dealing with one example. So I want to let that epsilon be any number greater than zero. It is a fixed number, but it's any fixed number greater than zero. Well, now we're going to kind of just simplify this. So we're going to have 3x minus 15 less than epsilon. And then we have, uh, what we can do is we can actually pull out that 3, and we'd have 3 times x minus 5 less than epsilon. And actually, because this is a linear problem, it's a little bit easier. We can actually fix that x minus 5 inside the absolute values, pull the 3 out, because obviously 3 is greater than uh, 0. And we're actually able to isolate the x minus 5 less than epsilon over 3. And so remember, we want the x minus the c value, the c being 5, to be less than epsilon to indicate that f of x minus l is in fact less than, uh, I said that wrong, x minus the 5 less than delta, in fact, tells us the f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So what we did is we started with the f of x minus the l, we simplified that, we're able to actually get to the x minus c inside the absolute value by itself, and we have it now less than a value. And so what we can do is we can say, let's let the delta equal epsilon over three. And I apologize, my screen's writing terribly. Let me see if I can clean that up. This is equal to the epsilon over three. Now, what we've done here is what I'm going to go back and label as my scratch work. Nothing so far has proved anything. All I've done is I've figured out the delta that I need to use. So now we're actually going to write up our formal proof. Proof. This is actually all that would be required in, say, an analysis class. It's just that without doing that scratch work there, I'd have no idea what I should be using as my delta. Once we did that scratch work, we were able to find what the delta should be. So proof given epsilon greater than zero, let delta equal epsilon over three. Because remember, epsilon is a set number. 
So epsilon, if epsilon is set, that means our delta is also set. It's whatever number we set it to be divided by 3. Well, then, if the absolute value of x minus phi, which has to be greater than 0 because it's positive, if that is less than this delta over 3, what that tells us is that we can multiply that 3 over, obviously, and we'd have 3 times x minus 5 less than epsilon. We can multiply that 3 into the absolute value, and we'd have 3x minus 15 less than epsilon. And then I can break that back up into 3x minus the 4 minus the 11. That still has to be less than epsilon, because all the steps above it were less than epsilon. And that 3x minus 4, that is our f of x. f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Therefore, we have proved the limit as x goes to 5 of 3x minus 4 is in fact equal to 11. Now, I kind of did this last, the second side over here pretty quick. And the reason I did it so quick is because I had all the work over here. That scratch work was kind of me doing the work in reverse. I set my function minus my limit less than epsilon. I simplified that. I recognized I could pull out the 3, and I moved it over. So all I'm doing is I'm starting here at the bottom saying, well, I need to get back to just that epsilon. I need the function minus the limit less than epsilon. So I multiply that 3 over. I distributed it in, distributed it in right there. And then I said, well, wait a minute. I can break that 15 back up as a 4 and 11. How do I know to do that? Because that's what we did done just a second ago when we are putting it all together. We had 3x minus 4 less than 11. And so there uh, is our first proof. Linear functions always much, much easier to prove than any other type of function. So let's do one that's not so easy. Let's prove the limit as x goes to 3 of x squared is equal to 9. Again, very easy to see how we would calculate this. We'd plug it in. But simply saying 3 squared is equal to 9 is not a proof. That is a function value. We want to prove that the limit is in fact equal to 9. And so we have to use our delta de epsilon proof. I'm going to start with our scratch work again. We need to figure out what we need to let delta be. So let's start by setting epsilon greater than 0, just some fixed number. What we want to show is that our function x squared minus the limit is in fact less than epsilon. I'm going to factor this down to x plus 3 times x minus 3. Why would I do that? Because I'm trying to get that, that x minus 3 by itself, the, the x minus the c. We want to get that by itself. And we see at this point it's pretty close, but we still have this other term up here hanging around. So before, when it was just the 3 sitting there, that was pretty easy because we were able to break that off. We are able to really pull it to the front. I can still break it apart. I can say that the absolute value times the absolute value still needs to be less than epsilon because I don't care if the pieces are positive or negative. They're just two factors. So I can break them apart. But it's not as easy as before. We just had that 3 sitting up there, and we could divide that 3 over to the other side because that x is also changing. And so the problem is epsilon, this statement has to always be true, no matter of how big x gets or how small x gets. And, and so right now the problem is that that x kind of has the ability to run off, to run away pretty quickly. And that can really uh, cause us some problems. So we need to figure out some way of fixing that x plus 3 so it doesn't get too large. So just kind of write out what we're dealing with here. Our goal is to have x minus 3 less than delta in some for fashion, where that delta is a fixed number. Right now, we don't have that because of that x plus 3. We don't know that x plus 3 doesn't get large. I know there's a few kind of double negative in there, but we don't know. We don't know that that thing's not blowing up. And so the problem is if it goes really, really small, right, if this becomes tiny, then dividing epsilon by that tiny number, that's great because epsilon divided by something tiny turns into a larger number that kind of fixes it in. That's not, not a problem. But if this gets really large, 
then we drive that delta down to a very small number. That doesn't necessarily fix our problem. Then, then this thing can run away from what we have over here. So what we're going to do, let's take delta 1 to be less than equal to 1. Let's just fix it to start with. And why did I choose 1? doesn't actually matter. It's usually a, a very common pick number, but you could choose any positive number. One's just an incredibly easy number to work with. But the key is, I just need to restrict this in some way. I need to make sure that the x doesn't run away. So I'm going to restrict the, the uh, delta to be less than 1 for just a second. So if we do that, our delta neighborhood or our delta interval around C can go from x is equal to 4, because that would be, you know, remember our c value is 1, so we can go up to 4. Uh, could it go down to 2? Right? That's as, as much as that x is allowed to, to move by. Go from x is equal to 4 to x is equal to 2, depending on if we're adding or, or subtracting. We saw this in our last video when we are uh, finding those deltas. We're kind of setting up that delta neighborhood. We're saying the most we're allowing our x's to change is by 1. So if it goes up by 1, we get 4. If it goes down by 1, we get 2. And so then, uh, if we think about what those will give us, right, the most that we're going to have right here would be the 7, right? If x is equal to 2, we get 5. If x is equal to 4, we get 7. So the most this possibly could be is 7. Uh, the x plus 3 is going to have to be less than or equal to 7. If it's a 2, great, it's smaller. If it's a 4, it's a 7. We kind of always provide for that worst case scenario. And so now we have some way of fixing this x plus 3. We can come back over here. We can say, well, if that's at its largest is 7, Well, then we know that x minus 3 is going to be less than epsilon over 7. And this epsilon over 7 is going to be what we call delta 2. So that epsilon over 7 is kind of the same epsilon we had just a second ago in the last example. That was a nice easy case where we had a fixed number in front. But the danger again was what happens if we really allow that x to stray quite a bit. If that x strays quite a bit, well, that number is going to grow a lot faster than uh, simply the epsilon over 7, epsilon over, or even just epsilon over a fixed value, because that's not really changing, but that number can grow huge. So we now have two different epsilons, and so how do we rectify this? How do we fix this? We're going to set the actual, uh, I'm saying epsilon, we have two different deltas. We have two different deltas here. Um, one's based on epsilon, one was that picks, picked fixed value of 1. So the delta that I'm going to choose is actually the min of 1 epsilon over 7. It depends what our epsilon is to know what, which one it should be, right? So depending on what our epsilon is, maybe it's 1, maybe it's 7. If we want our epsilon to be, say, 15, if we're allowing for a very large range, well, then we choose a 1 to make sure we stay inside that, that epsilon neighborhood around our number. And so now that we have our delta, we can do our proof. Suppose, uh, so let me change that wording out like that. Given epsilon grand zero, let delta equal the min of one comma epsilon over seven. Both of those are just fixed numbers. So we're just choosing the smaller the fixed numbers. If the absolute value of x minus 3 less than delta is true, right, if we have that, then x squared minus 9 in absolute values, which is simply equal to x minus 3 times x plus 3, that has to be less than 7 times the absolute value of x minus 3, which is less than 7 over epsilon, let me clean that up again, 7 times the epsilon over 
7. Where did that epsilon over 7 come from? Well, that was what this thing has to be less than uh, based on uh, what we've set our, our delta to be. It could be 1. It could be even smaller. Uh, and so then here, this would be equal to epsilon. And we have set, shown that our function minus the limit value is less than epsilon. Therefore, the limit as x goes to 3, x squared is equal to 9. We've proven it. So again, these proofs are a little bit tricky. They are harder. This is not something I might expect you to do on a Calc 1 test. Uh, this is something you might see later on. What I do expect you to be able to do in this class is to be able to find those deltas given epsilon. So once we set that, that epsilon, it makes the problem a lot easier. Then we're not trying to do it, deal with any guesswork. What is going to be the smaller number? We just know right away. All right, we can find that value. We know what the smaller number is. We can calculate this right away. So that's what I expect you to be able to do.